Hi, I am Bart Rimey, Technology Lead Crystallization and co-founder at Sequoia Technologies. For today's webinar, I'm going to discuss how Sequoia Crystallization Technology is able to maintain and control nucleation inside of reactors for small organic molecules like active pharmaceutical ingredients. As such, we are able to master this particle size from the production itself, as well as any existing polymorphine. This has a drastic effect on both product quality, but as well as on overall production cost of crystalline material, as we are able to combine both the crystallization as well as the particle engineering into one single production step. So let us begin today's webinar by introducing crystallization to you. When I returned from industry to academy to study crystallization processes just short of 10 years ago, as a former polymer scientist, I was rather surprised of two major messages when I was visiting my first few conferences that were commonly used by both academics and industrial specialists. First of all, the nucleation of solute in solution was, or in fact is, considered as a no-go zone. Many specialists have greatly disencouraged me to pursue the route of nucleation, in fact, and such messages are also widely used in literature. On the other hand, continuous processes is the norm in many other production processes, like for example polymer production from cracking crude oil to the final production step, which is typically crystallization. Continuous crystallization is applied for the production of yarns, plastics, protrusion, and crystallization in flow from solution, like these interesting morphologies of polyethylene in the so-called shish kebab structures, which were already discovered more than 50 years back. If you look at existing continuous processes, for example in the pharmaceutical industry, well, they are rather to be found in formulation of the drug product, but never in processing the drug substance itself. At Sequoia Technologies, we push forward to more modern processing techniques for chemicals in general, and also more specific for today's subject, the continuous manufacturing of crystalline material from solution. The phase diagram of a solute in solution is determined by the thermodynamic stable solubility or saturation curve C. At temperatures below this line, the solute is partially solid and partially dissolved in the solvent at exactly concentration C. By heating the system, once the solubility line is crossed, the solute fully dissolves into a liquid solution. And then when cooling down again, this solution will cross the solubility line as the arrow indicates. You enter at that point the supersaturated zone, where the solute is no longer in equilibrium with its surroundings. To get back to the equilibrium state, the material needs to crystallize to get rid of excess free energy. The material, however, will not start immediately to generate crystalline material. To do so, a certain difference in temperature needs to be overcome to start generating so-called critical sites stable nuclei. Different mechanisms of this nucleation exist, each dominating at different degrees of supercooling, as opposed to the solubility line C, nucleation on crystal surfaces or on foreign material, both called heterogeneous nucleation, and nucleation only by interacting with other solute molecules in the homogeneous nucleation mechanism. This difference also referred to as the metastable zone with the delta C for that particular nucleation mechanism. Important notice is that the greater the distance becomes between the actual solution and concentration and C, at increased supersaturation sigma, the molecules do not need other solid surfaces anymore to start nucleation like the heterogeneous nucleation mechanisms. Also, nucleation regimes will run into competition, especially at lower supersaturation value sigma, splitting of crystals into fragments, which is called attrition, and surface and heterogeneous nucleation on foreign material. Key to avoid this competition is to increase sigma as much as possible by creating a large difference between actual use concentration and the solubility concentration at what single temperature. In general nucleation theory, on average, one billion of crystals per milliliter per second can be expected for any nucleation mechanism. As all these created crystals need to undergo identical conditions when a rather narrow crystal size distribution is expected. In large volume reactors, this is however very difficult to be achieved. When you look for example at large batch systems and their inherent inhomogeneities in temperature and concentration profiles, nucleation will run out of hand very rapidly. 
If you follow, for example, the crystal trajectories in a supersaturated liquid in a 3-ton crystallizer, using a propeller, for example, to mix the suspension, one can see that important differences in local concentrations of particles are present throughout the complete reactor. This on its own already results in a subdivision of these 3000 liters into zones where nucleation of undetermined mechanism may take place. Where crystals simply grow, or growth is arrested since locally saturation conditions are met. And therefore, quite logically, for these large processes, the most uncontrolled parameter, which is nucleation, is typically completely avoided. And indeed, if you look at typical process conditions for batch crystallizers, but also newer continuous approaches to crystallization, reaching the nucleation zone with all those unwanted side effects is avoided. By the help of single or multiple seeding steps to add crystals to a solution in a supersaturated state and slow cooling, at no point is the spontaneous nucleation zone reached. And as such, emphasis is put solely on the growth of already existing crystals. At the very end of the process, the material is then recovered and has nearly always to be reshaped by milling or grinding to reach the desired crystal size. And this adds up to a total of four different process steps for crystallization. Seed preparation, crystal growth, filtration and reshaping. At Sequoia, we opted differently. Inspired by high throughput, low volume reactors, as is the case in polymer chemistry, we chose to apply tubular reactors that are at measure with the rate of nucleation. A reduction in total volume results in an increase in control of the different process parameters which helps to maintain the number of nuclei produced as a function of time in control. Some of the most important advantages of these tubular reactors are listed and explained in details on the next slides. To start with, tubular reactors come with very precise temperature control when cooled by a surrounding liquid. The temperature drops at the initial injection in the tubular reactor at point zero in the order of 30 degrees Celsius per second. It was already demonstrated that for any solute-solvent combination, saturated state and nucleating conditions are reached very quickly. In this graph, aspirin reaches these conditions at the tube walls after one second or 0.5 meter displacement inside the tubing, indicated here by the blue dots. All liquid inside has then about 3 to 4 seconds to generate as many nuclei as possible, which is a function of the set nucleation temperature and residence time or reactor length. The suspension at the exit of the tubing is then gathered and set to grow until saturation is fully reached. Crystal size analysis point out that the nucleation rate of 10 to the 11th nuclei produced per cubic meter per second has been obtained for these conditions, which is exactly in line with what to be theoretically expected. Another benefit for the temperature control is a specific nucleation of the polymorphic form of choice. This feature is shown here for the molecule Brivaracetam. All nucleation above 15 degrees C result always in the formation of needle-like pseudopolymorph indicated with the red solubility line, whereas the fast quenching to low temperatures enable the control of polymorphism of the desired form 1 crystals. When the control of the nucleation is sufficient and fast enough, the solute concentration of the slurry has already dropped below the metastable zone width indicated in blue when exiting the tubing. The nucleation of form 2 after exiting is therefore avoided and an enantiopure crystalline material is obtained, shown in a microscopic image. Thanks to the high nucleation rates inside the tubular reactors, crystal growth times are highly reduced. It does not therefore take much time for the suspension to effectively reach the saturated state. For this shown example of adipic acid in crystallization in water, at a nucleation rate of about, again, 10 to the 11 crystals produced per cubic meter per second, saturated state is already obtained after 90 seconds, since the crystals do not grow anymore after this stage. And therefore, the crystal suspension is ready for filtration. And therefore, continuous filtration methods are very much suited and perfectly adjustable to the production rates achieved with the Sequoia crystallization rule. Another benefit is that the material is not given much time to grow to very large particle size distribution, which is an inherent benefit of the Sequoia crystallization technology. 
Next to that, thanks to the use of short residence time inside the reactor, all material has underwent true identical thermal history, which also hugely influences the time-based variation of product quality during a production. In this example, adipic acid crystallization is run for four hours in a row with nearly neglectable variations in average crystal size and size distribution indicated by the 10 and 90 percentile in size. Both stain at the same width for the samples that were taken every 30 minutes during this run. Also during this operation time, no blockage was observed at the tube exit provoked by any large crystals that were retained inside the reactor or coagulated on the tube walls. Indeed, the use of small enough capillaries prevent the formation of large crystals inside the reactors and also avoids encrustation. This benefit is possible because when small enough particles are formed, small enough meaning not yet subject to gravity, they will bounce off the tube walls thanks to the fluid movement imposed by both the flow velocity and their reactor dimensions. Due to the developed Poiseuille type of flow in the reactor, depicted in the scheme by the arrows, solid particles will be driven in this so-called Zegre-Zilberberg effect to an angular position somewhat off-center. Key is therefore to evacuate these particles in time. This parameter generally also determines the final size of the reactor, which can be easily adjusted for each different system. A last big advantage for the use of tubular crystallizers is that they simply do not occupy much space. Also, the parallel positioning of the reactors does not require new upscaling studies, as identical conditions are guaranteed inside every individual reactor. This is possible thanks to the automated software which imposes and monitors at the same time the flow velocity and temperature in each different reactor. This monitoring guarantees therefore the quality by design of the product exiting every single reactor as well. Our plug and play modules contain each one or multiple reactors and can be installed, replaced and run independently. Such an expandable and complete unit can reach adequate production rates without occupying precious space and can be delocalized easily while maintaining product quality. It can also handle different crystallization modes by simply exchanging to a different type of module to enlarge the crystallization scope whenever it is needed. This easy change in between crystallization reactors is possible since at Sequoia three different crystallization modes have been developed in which we can perform nucleations. The simple cooling mode, which is typically suited for oral solid doses between 20 and 60 micrometer average size. The antisolvent mode using frontal collision, which is ideal to reduce particle size down to a few micrometers in size. And finally, the anti-solvent mode in the co-flow setup for even more complex nucleation systems. For example, to avoid oiling out whenever the phase separation between the solute and the anti-solvent becomes much too intense. Some of the next examples show the application of different crystallization modes on some disclosable molecules. The resulting particle sizes and nucleation rates are shown as well. For Brivaracetam and Lamivudine, in collaboration with UCB Pharma and GlaxoSmithKline, we were able to demonstrate the control of polymorphism by both a temperature selection for nucleation and a specific slurry treatment for Lamivudine, resulting in both cases in exactly the required particle size attributes. Do remark again the very typical estimated nucleation rates, as well as the small standard variations in obtained crystal size for both examples. By applying our patent-pending technology, increased nucleation rates can always be obtained by altering the hydrodynamic behavior of the liquid inside the tubular reactor, reducing the obtained par average particle size at identical thermodynamic conditions. The big advantage of sequoia crystallization technology lies in fact in the optimization of the conditions using first the two-dimensional dependency of concentration and temperature. After this, we add the third dimension, which is the hydrodynamic behavior inside the reactor, which helps to further increase the nucleation rates, rendering an even more refined product. Using the antisolvent mode shown here, smaller crystal sizes can be obtained for very specific applications, even submicrometric particles can be reached, depending on the production parameters, of course. 
Also in organic materials like zinc hydroxide, which we can produce in a window of 0.5 to 4 micrometer average particle size, have been successfully tested also during 24-hour test runs. For systems where oiling out of course of the solute producing amorphous material, like the case of tereftalic acid, the use of a co-flow system proves to be very useful. Not only were we able to obtain 100% pure crystalline tereftalic acid, it also surpassed by far the particle size distribution of the benchmark commercial product we needed to be compared to. For aspirin, also a synthesis step was directly coupled to the crystallizer. The acetylation step of salicylic acid was executed at high temperatures, quenched with water, and injected straight away into the tubular crystallization reactor. This avoided naturally the burden of intermediate stockage, purification, and product degradation, which is always a risk for aspirin. In this case, we were able to fully demonstrate how sequoia crystallization technology can help to tune towards the desired crystal size during production. The stepwise variation of the nucleation temperature in which the reactors are put into has a drastic effect on eventual average particle size. As a fact, the blue average crystal size curve as a function of set nucleation temperature can be used to set the instrument specifically at the desired resulting crystal size. This means that the guaranteed quality by design of the production makes it possible to program in between two production runs a totally different crystal size by only changing the nucleation temperature and leaving the different reactors unaffected. And this in all makes Sequoia's crystallization unit a uniquely versatile production tool. On-demand production of crystals of a certain size becomes accessible. Once the crystals are produced, they need to be removed from the slurry of course. We try to keep a very open perspective for this, so that for different applications, different separation technologies could still be used. Also depending on in-house existing technologies and expertise at the clients. We however already selected specific markers specialized in filtration. Also for GMP pharma productions. For continuous belt filtrations, for example, candle filter technology, drying and deagglomeration units, and spray drying technologies as well. And of course, for some products, there will be a necessity for different post treatments. And in those cases, Sequoia crystallization technology can be regarded as simply a generator of nuclei that are grown or treated separately to, for example, lay a coating on top of the crystal for controlled drug release, create structured particles, and other applications. Here you have our takeaway messages we find important for today's webinar. You can indeed control nucleation of small solutes in solution by using our tubular reactors and steer the form and size of the crystals by adapting the thermal and hydrodynamic parameters to the nucleation of that very system. We are already in the phase to scale up to production quantities, also using the quasi freely selectable filtration method. And this results in a unique and versatile crystallization tool for production. Now we only want to expand our knowledge and expertise by working together to develop new processes on our units. And with this, we come to the end of this webinar. I would really like to thank you for your attention and hope to meet you soon, although it will be in a virtual way for some time to come.